Good evening, everyone. Welcome to April's Open Mic Night. Tonight we are joined by Jerry Brust with University of Maryland Extension, who will speak with us about pest and disease management, as well as Sharifa Williams, who will talk with us a little bit about the 2020 Ag Census and why it's important to be counted as an urban farmer. Um, but before further ado, I just wanted to um, let you all know that you're welcome to put any questions that you have in the chat box throughout the presentation or Jerry or Sharifa may pause um, and take some questions, but feel free to utilize the chat box. I will be um, saving the chat box as well as sending out a recording uh, after this is done tomorrow, okay? All right, so without further ado, Jerry, thank you so much for being with us tonight and special thanks to Linda Jones for securing Jerry as a speaker this evening. Well, thank you for having me here tonight. <clears throat> this chilly uh, mid-April evening. Uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is vegetable pest management, but since uh, I'm a big talker and I only have an hour, so we're going to just look at the uh, insect pests. If you have questions about diseases, diseases are always tough because it is uh, difficult to tell a disease just from a picture. But from an insect and insect damage, it's a little bit easier to tell that from a picture. So in the future, if you run into something, you don't recognize what it is, you are more than welcome to send me pictures of this in my email, which I'll have near the end. And you can email me the pictures and ask me if I can recognize what it is, okay? So what I'm gonna start off with, what I always start off with, is I talk about natural enemies of insect pests. And the reason I do this is because 80 to 90% of all the management that goes on with your insect pests that you have in your garden and in your field are controlled by natural enemies. And so most of the time, we don't have to worry about pests because of these natural enemies. Sometimes we do. Uh, the pests will uh, outproduce our natural enemies, and then we have to step in with some kind of control. And so I'll talk about that at the end. But I want to, more than anything, introduce these natural enemies to you so that you're able to recognize them during the season. Because what often happens is you'll get some damage by a pest, and then you'll start looking to see what caused that damage. And about 50% of the time, you actually run into a natural enemy. And if you don't recognize it, you think that is the pest. Because you see the damage, you look for a pest insect, and you see this insect that is right there at the damage. But that is what the, the natural enemies do. They go after these pests. And when the pests cause damage, they go after the pests and try to eliminate them. And oftentimes that they do, and that leaves you with just their uh, presence at that damage. So that's what I'm gonna go talk about tonight, some of the, uh, the most common ones you're gonna find and that you should see in your field just about every year. And we're gonna start off with this one. <clears throat> Normally, if I do this in person, I, I, I ask questions like, what, what do you think this is? Most of the time, people know what this is. It's a spider, right? The one on top is called a lycosid. This is a wolf spider. And if you look at the picture up the upper right-hand corner, that is the one that they use for the Harry Potter spider. Uh, I forget the name of the Harry Potter spider, but that is the exact face that they use to make that particular spider. The one down in the uh, lower left-hand corner is called a jumping spider. And the one over in the lower right-hand corner is called a uh, water strider spider. And these spiders, the reason I'm bringing these up, these guys are really good with scarfing up anything that falls off of the plant. So if we get a windy day like we've had today, it will knock a lot of the pests off the plants. And when those pests fall off the plant, they can easily get back up onto the plant. But because of guys like this, the, the wolf spider 
and the jumping spider, uh, they don't make it. And so these are things we like to see uh, in our garden. We often don't, people don't like spiders, so they tend to shoo these away or God forbid, they actually squish them. So we, we like to see these. This is something you want to see in your garden. These wool spiders, they won't bother you. The only time they'll bother you is if you try to pick them up. If you don't pick them up, they're not going to attack you. They're not going to bite you. Okay? And so they run, run their prey down, and they inject it with an enzyme, which starts to dissolve it. And then they suck up the juices of the thing they kill. They do not use webbing. Okay, wool spiders and jumping spiders do not use any webbing. Okay. The next one, I think most people would recognize this as the daddy long legs. It's an open leonid is the uh, order name. Not that that's important, but these guys are just like the wool spiders. And they're very good at scarfing up anything that falls on the ground. Now they tend to go after things a little bit smaller than the wool spider. Wool spider goes after large things like large caterpillars and beetles and things like that. While the daddy long legs or the harvestmen go after things like mites and aphids and thrips that happen to fall off the plant. And so we're looking for these guys to also be in your garden and be active. Uh, at the near the end of this, I'll show you what you can do to attract these uh, natural enemies into your garden or into your field at the same time. Okay, this is another ground dwelling uh, predator that we will like to see out in the field. This is a centipede. And you tell it's a centipede versus a millipede. The millipede has its legs underneath its body. The centipede has its legs on the outside, on the sides of its body. Okay, there's one pair of legs per segment. In millipedes, there's two legs per segment, okay? Or uh, two pairs of legs. Uh, these guys run along the uh, forest floor or the garden floor, and with their antenna out in front, and I'm wiggling this so you can see this is the antenna right here. These are its jaws right here. And so these are its legs. So it runs forward with its antenna out front. And as soon as it contacts something, it jumps on this and uses its poison jaws and injects a toxin into the, its prey. And that starts to liquefy their prey. And then they begin to chew it up and it starts to break it down. Now I know this sounds terrible and it sounds like uh, you, this is something you don't wanna fool with. But our centipedes that we have here in the United States are too small. Their jaws could not penetrate into your skin. Okay, so they're not going to be a real problem for you. Uh, now, if you're if you're in Central America, that's something different. Central American uh, centipedes can give you a nasty bite, but here in America, uh, these centipedes aren't going to give you a nasty bite. They're not that large, but they'll go after things like caterpillars and beetles and stink bugs and things like that, again, that fall to the ground. They're not necessarily going after things that are in the soil, but that things that fall off the plant. And so that's why after a heavy rain or a heavy windstorm, we actually lose a lot of our pests that are on the plants because when they're knocked off, these guys I just showed you are going to pick them up and eat them. All right. Now, this particular group, this is a very large group, and these are called carabids. And people usually ask me to spell carabids. And I usually need a pen because otherwise I can't do it. And these are C-A-R-A-B-I-D-S. So if you want to know how to spell the name, they're also called ground beetles. And this is a huge family. This is one of the largest family of insects there are. And yet we hardly ever see these out in our field 
or our garden. And yet I guarantee you that they're out there. This one on top is called Harpalus pensibanicus. Uh, it's very active uh, later in uh, June, July, and into the fall. Now, some of these other ones, like this Bimbidian right here, it's active now. And this is the general size of crabbits that you see it on the back of somebody's hand. They're not, they're medium sized insects. They're not real large, but they're not small either. And these guys not only go after anything that falls off the plant, but the littler ones like this Bimbidian and this ter Terastachus uh, beetle will actually climb the plants and search for prey. But they don't do this during the daylight hours. They only do it at night. And so carabids as a whole are only active at night. And this is why we don't see them very often. If you went out there with a flashlight, you would start to see them much more active uh, after about 10 o'clock at night is when the humidity starts to come up uh, around ground level, they become more and more active. They like high humidity. And so they become more active and they start to climb the plants looking for prey. If I may ask, um, this year I had <clears throat> a beetle that was eating some of my flower petals and it was around June and I looked it up and it, the common name was like June beetle. Is that one of these that is present? No. That, that is a, June beetles are herbivores. These guys are all predators. None of these guys uh, will go after uh, your plants. Okay, uh, thanks. Sure. The, they're, they're more flattened uh, than the June bugs or June beetles. Uh, they're the June bugs, June beetles, a little more fat and robust. Uh, these guys are a little more elongate as you can see here and here. And their legs stick out to the side. The other thing is they don't like to fly. They very seldom fly. So if you see something flying around your lights at night, it's not a carabin. It's not a, a predatory beetle, okay? It's probably going to be more likely a herbivorous beetle, something that goes after your plants. Okay, so these guys are really good. And uh, they'll uh, consume a lot of prey over a, a uh, evening. So it's something we would really like to see these guys out in your farm field or your garden. Uh, and there's some easy ways that you can get them out in your field. And for all these ground beetles, this is one way to do it. Plus the centipedes and plus the wool spider. And that is nothing more than straw mulch. And so you put straw mulch wherever you want it. Some people use a straw mulch as paths into their garden and through their garden and, or their field. That's fine too. Some people use it in just one block of area where it's, they'll just have straw mulch. And sometimes they put plants in it, sometimes they don't. Everybody's a little bit different. But what you wanna have is a straw mulch because this will attract the beetles and the wool spiders and the centipedes to over daylight there. They don't like to be active at daylight, so they want to hide under something. So they'll hide under this straw mulch. And then at night, they'll start to activate themselves and they'll start to leave the straw mulch area and go out into the field. And so that's exactly what you want. You can have the straw mulch around your plants. That works too. Everybody, again, like I said, is a little bit different. Some people like to have just pure ground, uh, a nice clean ground around their plants. Some people like to have straw mulch. Either one will work. As long as you have some of the straw mulch in your field or in your uh, garden, okay? All right. Now we're gonna go up into the foliage. We're gonna look at predators that are mostly concerned with your foliage pests. And this is one of the most common ones that you'll see. You're not gonna see it this close up ever. And that's what confuses some people. But this is uh, one particular pet pro, uh, predator, bleh, 
that you're going to have every single year in your garden or your field unless you use a lot of pesticides. Okay. Does anybody, <clears throat> normally I ask, does anybody recognize what this is? If it you is, do, is it, is go it, ahead. Is it a nymph of a ladybug? Very good. It's an immature of a ladybug. And there's a couple, couple ways you can tell a ladybug larva, an immature, from just about anything else. It has six legs, as you can see, and they're always out to the side of the insect. And then it's got a long body that tapers in the back. So you got this longer body and starts to taper to the back. And it is almost always or, um, a black or a purple color overall with orange or yellow spots. Okay, there's nothing else out there that has this body shape that has orange or yellow spots on a purple background. And that is ladybug larvae. And they do not eat plants. They only eat other insects. They eat nothing else. Okay, the adults do the same thing. It's, this is unusual for an adult to eat the same thing as a immature. But in this case, uh, they both eat the same thing. And this is what the mature or the adult looks like. Uh, they come in different uh, shapes, the ladybugs. Ladybugs are a very large group, but this is how we re usually recognize them, sort of this concave look to them. Usually it was some spots, sometimes no spots. So uh, up here, these two pictures at the top are uh, adult ladybugs. These are the eggs of ladybugs right here. They're always laid on end and they're laid in nice little clean groups, very well organized. So you get anywhere from five to six uh, ladybug eggs to up to 20 ladybug eggs in a group, okay? <clears throat> These are what the immatures look like when they first hatch from the eggs. Again, you can see that tapered body right here and it tapers to the end. Here's the head. And here are the legs out to the side, these black legs, always out to the side, sort of like an alligator. And they sort of run like an alligator. Now, when is they the first- egg, Is the egg always that golden color? The eggs are always this yellow, sometimes they're a little more orange, uh, but they're usually a, ye a yellow orange color. Now, as they get, the larvae get a little bit older, a little bit bigger, they start to get, develop the yellow spots, as you see here. Now, the one thing that the female ladybug has to be good at, she has to be good at where she's going to lay her eggs. And so she has evolved over time so that if she runs into, let's say, a group of aphids, she'll actually count the number of aphids that are present or uh, right there. And if there's enough aphids there, she will go ahead and lay her eggs. And sometimes, it, depending on how many aphids there are there, she'll lay 10 eggs. Sometimes she'll lay 25 eggs. And then she'll leave the area. So oftentimes you will not see these adults, but you will find their eggs. And so that's what you need to be able to look for are these eggs. Because if she lays them in a place where there aren't enough prey, these guys, when they hatch, after they finish off the prey, will begin to feed on each other and, and they will begin to cannibalize their own eggs. So the female has to be very good about what she does and she has to make sure she makes an accurate count and lays eggs in a place where her offspring will have enough food to develop into adults, okay? So these are ladybugs. Uh, does anybody recognize what this predator is? No, but I sure wanna know. <laughs> okay. Uh, these are lacewing eggs. 
And as you can see, the lacewing eggs, the green lacewing, always lays her eggs on the end of these hair-like stalks. So she always has these hair-like stalks, and at the end of them are her eggs that she lays. Are we going to be able to see that with her naked eye? Because I know yes. the you oh, can see it right. see it very easily with with your naked eye. You won't see the hair like stalks sometimes. You'll just see these eggs and look like they're hanging from something. Wow, uh, I hope I see that soon because I haven't seen that before. Wow. This is what you need to look for. And uh, the question is, why do they lay them on these hair like stalks? And in nature, you can do one of two things. You can breed in aggressiveness into your offspring, or you can make them less aggressive. In the lacewings case, they have made their offspring extremely aggressive. And they're so aggressive that if this egg hatched right here, and they were all laying on the surface of this leaf, this first one that would hatch would eat all her brothers and sisters. Okay, that's what we call aggressiveness. They're not going to stop just because they're committing uh, uh, a family side. They're eating their brothers and sisters. And so to protect the other eggs from being eaten, they put them on these hair-like stalks. So when this egg hatches, the little larvae crawls up this egg, and they has a strong desire to go down and eat these other eggs. So... But the problem is when they start to crawl down, they find out these little barbs come up like this on these hair-like stalks, and they can't pass down to get to the eggs. So the eggs are protected from these lace wings. They're also protected from other predators like ladybug larvae, because the ladybug larvae can't crawl down these hair-like stalks to get to the eggs. So all these eggs are protected because they're on these hair stalks. And so you want to look for these hair stalks and these white little eggs. They'll start to turn green where they're getting ready to hatch. This is what the adult looks like. And this is why it's called a lace wing. You can see how big the wing is and how lacy it is. These guys are not predators, though. They, they will not prey on anything. They like nectar and pollen, right? And this is what the larvae look like right here. They're usually a whitish color, uh, light brown, and then they have dark patches on them, like you see right here, dark patches. But you also see that the legs are always out to the side, okay? The other thing is they're sickle-like mouth parts. This is very unusual. These are very large, and you can see these with the naked eye if you see these little guys crawling around. You'll see the head end, and you'll see this sickle-like mouth part. And what they do, they go up to anything, they grab it, they suck the juices dry, and they fling it aside. They go up to the next insect, they grab it, they suck it dry, and fling it. And then they go on and on. So again, they're a very aggressive uh, little larvae. They'll attack something like this caterpillar that's two or three times their own weight and, and kill it and then chew it up and suck it dry. So these lacewing larvae are very good predators of caterpillars and aphids and mites when they're small. As they get bigger, then they'll go after larger caterpillars, okay? So these guys are really good predators to have on your foliage. And it all starts with these eggs. You're probably not gonna see the adults very often, but you need to look for the eggs, okay? Okay, <clears throat> this one, uh, I always, wonder if I should show it to people because you're not going to see this one. This one's very small. Uh, and I'll show you a picture of how small it is here in a few minutes. But this is Aureus insidiosus. This is the insidious flower bug. This is the adult. And this is the immature. And so the immature is sort of this little teardrop shape. It has these reddish eyes. They're kind of orangish in color. 
you're never going to see these because they're they're going to be very small. All right, these you're going to be able to be able to see with the naked eye pretty easily. And you're going to look for a color, a uh, different uh, color pattern. And so this is the head end, because here in the antenna. And so up near the head, it's going to be dark colored. And then there's going to have a light color band in between that, right after that. And then you're going to have another dark colored band. And there's always going to be this little wedge shaped white color. You see that white shape right here? And you'll be able to see that with the naked eye, even though this little bug is very tiny. Okay, why am I showing you this bug if you're probably not going to see it? It's because of this is a generalist predator. It'll kill a lot of different uh, pests, but it especially likes thrips. If you have a problem with thrips, this is the predator you want to have in your field or your garden. Because this guy will go after thrips first and foremost over anything else. The next thing I'll go up. To track that in particular, because I, I work in a greenhouse, which we know thrips are prevalent. Okay. If I had it in a greenhouse situation, this is the a time I would buy aureus insidiosus and release them. Okay, because you're not going to really attract them into a greenhouse. It's going to be difficult. They is don't. The same, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is, is it the same situation as um, with the ladybugs that they have to already be aw awakened before you actually bring them in so that they don't fly away? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Normally, I don't recommend for field work uh that we get any natural enemies that we buy any natural enemies in a greenhouse situation it's different you we can't really attract them into the greenhouse they won't come so we have to bring them in buy them bring them in and release them and they'll start to search your plants for these pests and so i i go i recommend for greenhouse situations that you buy your pests and release or predators and release them for a field situation, I do not recommend that ever because you're wasting your money. They do not work when you release them. They will leave the area in, in the field. They won't do a very good job of going after your pests. And so we need to invite them in naturally so that their population is there and we're not introducing a whole bunch of new ones. The new ones just don't work. I know they'll try to tell you differently, but they don't. Okay. All right, this is the type of damage that thrips and mites do. I just wanted to throw this in so you know what mites and thrip damage looks like, so you know to be prepared for it. This all on here on the left-hand side is moderate mite damage. You can see the little white specks on the leaf. That is all their feeding damage. And what they do, the mites will suck chlorophyll out of the leaf. And all they leave behind are empty cells. And that's what you see here, are these little white empty cells of plant tissue. Because the chlorophyll has been sucked out. The thrips, this is what thrips damage is right here. <clears throat> the thrips will scrape the leaf and do damage to the leaf and then the chlorophyll oozes out of that damaged leaf and they lap it up. But you see what the difference is between this leaf right here and this leaf. What, a, what, what thing do you notice in this leaf that you don't see in this leaf? It looks to me like the one to the right is more of a blotchy situation and the one to the left is um, like almost mottled or dotty. Okay, yes. This is a little bit more damage. The thrips do a little bit more damage to the leaf early on than the mites. But this, the mites will st start to do real damage after a little bit. But the thing you, I wanna call your attention to are these little black specks. Do you see these black specks right here? Okay, that tells you this is thrips damage. Why? Because this is poop. 
This is Thrips poop right here. And so Thrips poop is black. Mite poop is clear or white and you don't see it. Okay, you see the damage and that's what this is up here. So this is mite damage, Thrips damage. No black specks, black specks. Okay, you see the difference? So when you start to see this scraping, what looks like little scrapings on the leaf, first look to see if you see any black specks. Okay. If you see the black specks, you know you have thrips. If you don't see black specks and it's clear, then chances are you have mites. Okay. All right, what can I do to get aureus to come into my area? And this is one of the things that I found that works real well, and it's a multi-headed sunflower. Okay. People always ask me what cultivar this is, and I don't know what cultivar this is. I'm sure they don't have it anymore. They seem to change cultivars of sunflowers every two years. So what you want to get is a multi-headed one that does not produce a lot of pollen. Okay. And they call those table cut sunflowers. Why do they call them table cut sunflowers, tabletop sunflowers? It's because when you cut them and put them on a table, they don't shed pollen all over the freaking place. All right. And so that's what you want. You want something that produces a little pollen because that'll attract aureus, but you don't want something that produces a lot of pollen because that'll attract the thrips and the thrips will overwhelm the predator. And so you do not want to have a giant uh, sunflower in, in your garden or your field because that'll attract too many pests. You want something that'll attract a few pests, but not a lot. And that is what this multi-headed sunflower will do. Okay. Now you can get them different colors. You can get them in yellow. I, I happen to like this one. This one's sort of a reddish color. Uh, some are reddish some are dark purple, some are bright yellow, some are orange. They come in different colors. Pick whatever color you like. It won't matter. It'll still attract aureus. Okay? Aureus will still come to flowers like this and take up residency. Now, this is a close-up of one. And I simply took it and started to irritate the center of the uh, flower. And you see aureus starting to run out. And I just happened to be able to get a picture before it took off. And that's it right here. This is Aureus. Everybody see him? Notice the antenna sticking out right there. And it's a little dark patch right behind the antenna. And then a light patch. And then a dark patch with that little white wedge. And you can tell, you can see that with the naked eye. And that sort of... This picture tells you the size of aureus insidiosus, okay? So they're very tiny. So imagine the immature is about a third this size. So it is still in here, the immatures, they'll stay in here. The mature ones will come and go because they can fly. So they'll leave this area, go search your plants for thrips and then come back during the day Sometimes at night, they'll stay in the, the flower head and then they'll go out again. So they, they go back and forth, back and forth. The immatures will develop and become matures and become adults. And then they'll lay eggs and then they'll start to cycle over again. And so you can have three or four cycles of these predators come in and out of these sunflowers. So these are good guys. How quickly do they cycle? Uh, it takes about a month. They go from egg to egg. Okay. This is something I just wanted to show you real quick. A lot of times, uh, some growers will tell me, well, that, you know, that, that works fine for a small garden, but it's not going to work well in a large field. And so this is something I, I always like to show. This is work I did down when I worked in Southern Florida in vegetables. And this is about 10 years ago. 
And 10 years ago, they could not control their thrips. They had run out of chemicals that would do anything to thrips. And so their peppers were being destroyed by thrips. They could not get a good harvest because of the thrips. All right. So what we did is we planted the multi-headed sunflowers in the field on the side of the ditch bank where crops aren't grown anyway. This caused aureus to come into these areas by the thousands, hundreds of thousands actually. And they went into the field over time as the thrips became more populous on the peppers in the field. So after just one season, the growers were able to harvest uh, peppers when before they couldn't because of these natural enemies. And <clears throat> this is a block of peppers, or it's going to be a block of peppers, and it's two acres. This is another block of peppers. There's another block. There's 50 blocks of peppers in this one field. And each block is two acres. So this is a hundred acre field that we were able to plant these, not in every block, but every fifth block, we're able to plant these sunflowers and they are able to increase aureus enough that it decreased the thrips in the field. So it is possible to do this on a very large scale. It's possible to do it on a medium scale. It's possible to do it on a very small scale. It's whatever scale you want to use it in, it'll work. Okay. Now, one thing I have to tell you, they don't, they no longer use this. And the reason why, because a new chemical came out and they started using it and it killed thrips really well. And so they abandoned this biological control program. And it's just what they're going to do because it's easier to manage spraying a chemical than it is to manage putting this row yeah. Of sunflowers up all the time. That's such a shame. <laughs> That's such a shame. Yeah, it, it, it was disappointing, but I was happy to see, see the concept work. Okay, what do you think this is? A pollinator. Okay, actually, it's a pollinator. Uh, do you, you would guess it's a bee, wouldn't you? I'm going to say a wasp, actually. <laughs> okay. It's not a wasp either. Uh, this is a fly. And how do I know it's a fly? Because it has one pair of wings. Okay. All flies have one pair of wings. Okay. All bees, hymenoptera, wasps, all other flying insects have two pair of wings or four wings. So flies have two wings. All other insects have four wings. So this is the, its other pair of wings. It has shrunk them over time into these little things called halters that they use to balance themselves. But why do you think it looks like a bee? Because it has yellow on black. And yellow on black in nature says, beware, stay away from me. I'm going to sting you. You don't want to fool with me. And so this fly, though, does not sting. He mimics bees and wasps. So people leave him alone. This is a very large family, and they're called syrphids. S-Y-R-P-H-I-D, syrphid. And they're called surfeit flies. They're also called flower flies. Some people call them sweat bees because they like to hover right around your eyes when you're sweating and they like to drink your sweat. Right? This is another picture of one. And you see this one looks even more like a bee than that other surfeit. But because they're flies, what do their immatures look like? All immature flies are maggots. And that's what this is. It's a maggot. But in this case, it's a predatory maggot. It's a maggot that preys on other insects. And this actually happens to be a real pretty one. 
Most of them are not this pretty. Most of them look like this. Kind of dull, kind of ugly, not much to them. This is the back end of it. And this is the front end of it, the head. Yeah, you won't see any legs in it because maggots don't have legs. It's just sort of a little worm-like thing. But you'll see it on your foliage and you'll see it where there's aphids or mites or thrips. And you'll see these little maggot-like things crawling around. And that tells you that you have surfed fly maggots on your leaf. And that's something you want to see. You won't see the eggs. The eggs are small and they're laid in the leaf tissue. But you will see the uh, immatures. Now the adults, I'll go back here. The adults uh, aren't predatory. The adults feed on nectar and pollen, okay? They're not interested in prey. The only time they're interested in prey is when they wanna lay their eggs. And so they're gonna lay the eggs someplace where they're gonna have uh, prey for the larvae to eat. All right. The next group, these are called predatory mites. And you're never gonna see these, they're too tiny. But the reason I wanna point them out to you, because if you have two spotted spider mite problems, these mites often come to the rescue. And you won't realize it because you won't be able to see them. So I have a general rule of thumb that you can use to tell if you have these mites on your foliage or not, okay? And so what you wanna look for is the damage that the mites cause, the, the two spotted spider mites. And I showed you that damage a little bit early on. They look like little white spots on the leaf. So you turn that leaf over. So you're looking at the underside of the leaf. And what you're gonna be looking for are these little orange, usually orange, reddish uh, spots. And that's all they're gonna be is these little spots. And they start to move very quickly. And they move, if you can watch my cursor, they move like this. And they move at right angles and they move rather quickly. Just like this. So you're looking for those orangish, reddish spots that move quickly like that. Now, the things that are eating your plants, they move like this. They just sort of move in a straight line, uh, not in a big hurry. Uh, and that's about it. And so orange spots move quickly at right angles. Pre the ones that the herbivores that feeding on your plants move in straight lines or diagonal lines. Okay. And that's not the only way you're going to tell them apart because they're just too small otherwise. And so you look for that when you see the damage. Look for these orange, I mean, yeah, these orange or red spots that are moving quickly. Okay. All right. This is a, another large group of insect predators. And these are called tachinids. And you can see it looks like a fly and it is a fly. And a lot of them look like uh, uh, very large, robust house flies, okay? They're sort of grayish black, two wings with these red, red eyes. Not that it's important, but they have these great big seedy on their back ends. And that's how I can tell them apart from other flies. But these are parasites, okay? And what they do, this is a female, tachinid, and she'll go up and she'll lay an egg, let's say on a caterpillar or some other host of hers. So she'll lay the egg, and that's what the eggs look like on the caterpillar. And the eggs look like uh, grains of rice that have been stuck to the caterpillar. So these eggs, although you can't really tell, have already hatched. And they've hatched from the bottom side directly into the caterpillar. 
Okay. So these have hatched, but you're not going to see any hatch on top. They hatch from the bottom directly into the caterpillar. So the larvae are already inside this particular caterpillar. The question I was asked is why do you think 90% of the time the eggs are laid up by the head of the caterpillar or the insect host? Why do you think the fly does this? Okay, this is when I usually give a physical demonstration that everybody just loves. Sorry, I lost myself for a minute there. Um, I'd say to mobilize the, um, the insect host. It will eventually mobilize them, but not until they get a lot bigger, not until the maggots get a lot bigger inside a caterpillar. Okay, if, uh, if I was a limber caterpillar, and I was a limber caterpillar many years ago, and somebody laid an egg down by my knee, I can use my mouth parts and bend and crush that egg with my mouth parts. Where's the only part of my body I cannot reach with my mouth parts? Ha ha ha, yes, your head. <laughs> yeah, that's right, right up around my shoulders or my head. And so the thing I want to point out here is in nature, things don't happen just by happenstance or by luck. Things happen for a reason. And so these eggs are laid in a particular place by predators and these things we call parasites or parasitic flies. And so they're laid up by the head so that nothing can crush them. Now, the caterpillar work together with other caterpillars, other caterpillars can come and crush them, but they don't work together in teams. Okay, this is what the, this is the maggot right here. And it's leaving this cat, dead caterpillar. So it's killed the caterpillar. It's grown to this very large size that you see here. And now it's splitting the caterpillar and leaving the dead carcass. So this is what it looks like. And it looks just like a maggot because that's what it is, it's a maggot. Okay, this happens to be a, another true bug. This happens to be a leaf-footed bug. And where's the egg laid? Right up against the head. So this is what the egg looks like. This is what you wanna look for on caterpillars. You wanna look for it on uh, beetles. You wanna look for it on uh, bugs. You wanna look for this white thing this white little roundish oval egg up by the head. Now this egg has already hatched and the larvae is already inside the bug. This is a particular type of uh, trichop, this is called trichopoda penipes. And this particular one, and the reason I'm showing you this one out of the thousands I could show you is this one likes to go after stink bugs and squash bugs. And so you will find this out in your squash field in July and August, if you look for it. Every single year, this guy will be out in your field. It has an orange abdomen and it has these nice smoky black wings, okay? Orange abdomen, smoky black wings. There's nothing else that looks like this out in your field. So that's what you want to look for. And they're very good at hunting down stink bugs and squash bugs. And so here's the tachinid larvae. This is a stink bug I found out in the field. It was dead, but it just newly died. And you can actually see this tachinid or trichopoda uh, larvae inside the stink bug. It's still there, this little brown patch right here. Now, you don't have to look for that, okay? What you can look for, it's kind of hard to see because of the picture I took. See this little round thing right here? Right there, that's the egg of this trichopoda, this tachinid. And again, it's laid up by the head. This is where the eggs are almost always laid, up by the head. Sometimes on the abdomen, but most of the time up by the head.
And so these guys are really good at killing stink bugs and squash bugs. The only problem is they don't come out till later in the season. They don't come out until August, late July. I've been working on ways to see if I could get them to come out in June. If we could get them out in June, we could stop squash bugs from developing into large populations. But they just won't come out. I, I can't change their behavior enough to get them to be active during June. So that's one of the things that uh, uh, IPM people like me uh, try to do. Okay. Now we're going to move into another large group, and these are parasitic wasps. And the parasitic wasps have huge families, you know, four or 5,000 different species in a family. And they're all parasitic, just like that fly family I showed you, the tachinids. But this happens to be wasps, and they come in different sizes. They come in large sizes like this one. They come in very tiny sizes like this one. This is called a trichogrammon fly or a wasp, sorry. And this is the egg of Helicoverpa zia. This is the tomato fruit worm. And 10 of its eggs, 10 of these eggs right here of the worm, caterpillar, can be put on the head of a pin. So that tells you how small that egg is and she is laying an egg and you can imagine how tiny that egg is right on top of this egg and so this egg that she's laying will hatch and it will kill this egg before it ever develops and hatches into a larvae and so this is one of the best pest management uh, schemes that we can have is that the wasp attacks the eggs of the pest and so there is no larvae, there's no caterpillar that ever develops. And so these guys are really good. The thing is, you're never going to see them because they're so tiny. They're, they're about the size of a gnat. So you're just not going to notice them. But they're, they are active in your garden and your field every year. Now, others, like this parasitic wasp right here, is much larger. And so it goes after larger prey. It goes after things like this caterpillar that's much larger. So that's its prey. So its prey, every prey is a little bit different with every predator. Okay, does everybody recognize this? What are these white things on this hornworm larvae, this caterpillar? Does anybody know? It's a, a white fly. I can't remember the name right now. It's evading me. But yes, I've had this for years. Okay. These are not eggs. The parasitic wasp, right? Yes, they're a parasitic wasp. Very good. But they're not eggs. They're pupae. And so the wasp has come along, probably this wasp right here, and she's laid an egg one egg inside this caterpillar when it was smaller. That one egg is called polyembryonic. And what that means is that one egg divides into two eggs, which divides into four eggs, which divides into eight eggs. And they'll keep dividing like that. <clears throat> and the eggs, believe it or not, make the decision about how many times they're gonna divide and how many eggs they're gonna develop in that caterpillar. They're going to make that estimate based on how big they think that caterpillar is going to get. And so they made a good estimate, as you can see here, that one egg divided probably about 20 times. And that one egg developed all these individuals. Now, all these individuals are genetically the same. They're genetically identical to each other because they came from the same egg. Okay. <clears throat> They always show this picture for biological control, and it's good. It's a good biological control. But they also show it as a good pest management, and it's not a good pest management. Why is this not a good pest management? What are we trying to do in pest management? Manage the bad insects. Right. And so we want them to stop 
the bad insects stop them from doing what? Feeding on the plants, right? What, how big is this caterpillar? How much damage do you think this caterpillar has done to this tomato plant? Okay, he's, go ahead, Michelle. Probably half the tomato plant. It could take it, off the tops of it. Yes. <clears throat> you can see back here, there's no leaves on these stems. This thing is defoliated about a third of the tomato plant. Is that a good pest management scheme? No, it's not. So <clears throat> ecologically speaking, these guys are very valuable. Okay, this parasitic loss is valuable because when this caterpillar goes, and I'll go to the next picture, <clears throat> this is the cocoons, and this is the wasp that has come from the cocoon. And you can see about the size of it compared to the tail of the hornworm. So the wasp is a pretty decent sized wasp. And you see the little lids on the cocoons have all opened. And so that tells you the wasp have emerged from these cocoons. So these are my pictures. I simply brushed these cocoons off and this caterpillar is perfectly fine. And it'll continue eating. But when it goes to pupate, it will not have enough energy to turn itself from a, uh, a caterpillar into a moth. And it will die in the pupal case, okay? So ecologically, these wasps are very important in reducing the population of hornworms. But they're not important as pest management critters, okay? Because they don't stop the caterpillar from doing its damage. Does everybody see the difference between ecologically important and pest management important? I do. <laughs> okay, I, most people do when, when I give this talk. I see everybody's head shaking. So they understand the difference. <clears throat> Just because something is good ecologically doesn't mean we want to necessarily encourage it in our field or our garden. We don't want to discourage it. We never want to discourage a natural enemy. But we also don't want to necessarily encourage things that aren't going to do a very good job for us. And another example of that is spiders that form webs or orb weaver speed, uh, spiders. They're not very valuable to us pest management wise. Ecologically they are, but pest management they're not. And so I don't encourage people to get these kind of critters in their garden. It's the same thing with praying manids. I don't encourage you to get praying manids in your garden they're not gonna be very good predators. And that's because they hang out at flowers. And what visits flowers? Yeah, pollinators. And so they will kill pollinators left and right. They will kill bees. They will kill butterflies. They'll kill anything they can get a hold of that comes to that flower. And so we don't want something that's gonna protect the flower necessarily, especially if it's a pollinator. We want something that's going to protect our fruit and our foliage. And that's uh, these predators I showed you tonight are good pest management predators. All right. <sighs> okay. I got a good picture of uh, an assassin beetle that got a, um, a bumblebee on one of my dads at the end of the season. So, yeah, duly noted. Yeah, assassin bugs are, uh, I love to watch them. Uh, uh, but they'll go after everything too. And they'd like to hang out at flowers also. Um, uh, I mishandled one one time because I thought it wouldn't bite me because I'm an entomologist, but uh, it didn't seem to care. It went ahead and bit me and it gave me a nasty bite. And you do not want to fool with assassin bugs, okay? Yeah. Do I not fool. They have armor. <laughs> I sidestep them. <laughs> yeah, I definitely yeah. love them. Yeah, I would not pick them up or do anything, especially. All right. These, you can see a bunch of aphids. If you don't know, this is what aphids look like up close. 
there's two things in this picture that tell me I'm not going to treat these aphids and that they're going to be all dead in about a week. Okay, these are the two things I'm looking at. This one and this one right here. They look brown and bloated compared to these other aphids, don't they? You could pick these out pretty easily with the naked eye. And this is what you want to look for, these brown bloated aphids. Not these aphids. These are all alive and healthy. These two are dead. And I'll show you what happened. A wasp has come along and she lays an egg inside the aphid, one egg per aphid. Inside the aphid, this particular wasp larvae eats the aphid from the inside completely, eats everything. The only thing left is this exocuticle, okay? Now, when it pupates and becomes an adult wasp, it has jaws and it chews a hole in the aphid it flips that open and it emerges out of the aphid. So you can see this is the aphid, this brown bloated aphid. This is the emergence hole of the parasitic wasp. So you can see that the parasitic wasp is rather small because it developed inside this aphid. But you, we can actually look inside this aphid and see there's nothing left inside of it. The parasitic wasp larvae has eaten everything inside that aphid, okay? So that's my thumb, and this is a parasitized aphid. It's also called a mummified aphid. You'll see the term and you'll hear it, mummified aphid. And this is what they mean by a mummified aphid. You see it's brown and bloated, right? Okay, now you're experts. What are the blue lines pointing to? Hopefully you're saying mummified aphids. Okay. Mummified aphid. <laughs> right. And what are the red lines pointing to? Where they've emerged. Very good. <clears throat> this tells you the wasps have emerged from these aphids and they're active on your leaf. And so that tells you, you do not want to spray anything now. You don't want to spray, spray any soap. You don't want to spray any oils, nothing for at least a couple of days. Okay. These the wasps are happen to be very sensitive to uh, insecticidal soap. So do not spray soap. And of course, they're very sensitive to any insecticides. And what is the yellow uh, yellow uh, arrow pointing to? Active aphids. Very good. Uh, we, it may be parasitized, it may not, we don't know yet. We're gonna call that an active aphid. All right, very good. So these are the things you're gonna look for out in your garden and your field if you find aphids. You're gonna look for these brown bloated aphids. Okay, what can I do to bring these parasites, these predators into my garden or into my field? And that is, producing flowers that have nectar and pollen, okay? This is an example of the field at the bottom of the field, and I'll show you what the field looks like here in a few seconds. This is at the bottom of the field. This is wildflowers that we've planted at the bottom of the field. This is how big the field is. And so you can see the wildflowers way down here all along here. And so this is a patch of land that we don't do anything with, we never did. We just had to mow it. This is at one of the research stations, <clears throat> but you can have it as part of your farm, a place where you don't have a crop, you just have grass or weeds. And so you go ahead and plant these wildflowers in a place where you don't have a, a crop. And so this will attract natural enemies and pollinators. And these pollinators and natural enemies will come into this field. And I know this looks a lot bigger. It looks like it's a mile from here down to here, but it's not. It's only about uh, 300 yards. But these guys will move from this area 
into this entire field all through the summer. And what you need to have are flowers and pollinating flowers and flowers that are producing nectar and pollen. And there are uh, bunches of, uh, of these seeds that you can buy. Uh, Johnny has um, some good ones. Uh, they'll sell, sell, to these, sell, sell you these in packages in groups. And some of these groups are for pollinators, some are for uh, hummingbirds, and some are for natural enemies. And so you buy the ones for the natural enemies and you go ahead and have some spot in your garden or your yard or your field and you start growing these. Now, don't, don't grow as much as we did here because we got these seeds for free, all right? What you want to do, because the seeds are expensive, is just do a little area, you know, uh, 20 feet by 50 feet, and that's it. And you do that one year, and then two or three years later, you do another area next to it, and then another area, and then another area, and you keep increasing the size of it. Don't try to do it all at once, because you'll spend a lot of money, <clears throat> and it'll be too much. All right? So do it slowly over time. And... There's other seed catalogs that sell these type of things. Now, I just mentioned Johnny's just because I just happened to look at it the other night. And they have these seeds for sale in these packages that they'll sell you. And they'll have something like 10 different plants that they'll sell. And that's what you want. You want the flowers to be flowering early in the year, middle of the year, later in the year. So you want them to be flowering all through the spring, summer, and late summer. And that's what they'll sell you. Okay. Now, what happens if these natural enemies don't work sometimes? And sometimes they won't because the predators will just outnumber them and out reproduce them. So what do we do? And so these are my best horticultural organic insecticides that you could use. And the first one I always recommend are horticultural oils. And that could be neem oil, it could be a synthetic oil, or it could be a plant-based oil, okay? Any one of those works. And the oils work well, especially on small insects, on small caterpillars, on small pests. It's not going to do anything, though, for caterpillars, unless they're very tiny. Okay. And usually you don't notice caterpillars until they're a lot bigger. And so horticulture oils will not work on caterpillars. I'm just telling you that right now. <clears throat> the other thing I'd recommend is Bavaria bassiana. The product is called Botanigard. Bavaria bassiana is a fungus, but it only grows on insects. And it especially likes thin-walled insects. Things like thrips, mites, aphids. And they'll do a very good job in the spring and fall. But in the summer, the varia bassiana does not work very well because the fungus does not like heat. So if you've got a problem in July, the varia bassiana is not going to work. I would think about horticulture oils or insecticidal soaps in the summer. Okay. Insecticidal soaps, and I know a lot of people think, well, I'll just use a soap detergent that I have up on my kitchen sink. Don't do that, okay? Because insecticidal soaps are not the soap that you use to clean your dishes with. They're potassium salts of fatty acids. Okay? And what that means is when you spray those on a leaf tissue, they're not gonna do damage to the leaf tissue. The soaps that you get, that you wash your hands with, chances are they're gonna do damage to that leaf tissue. And so you don't wanna use them because of that. Insecticidal soaps, much safer for the plants. And they'll do a good job on the insects. Okay. I'm sorry, Jerry, could you go back to two for a second? What, what insects do you say those are targeting in particular? Uh, number two or number three? Number two. The very bassiana 
thin thin skin things like aphids and mites and thrips. Okay. Thank you. Small caterpillars. But again, most time you never see small caterpillars. You don't see them until later. Okay, so what do I do if I do have big caterpillars or thrips and I cannot control thrips with the hort oil? This is when you use number four and it's called spinosad. It's the active ingredient. One of the names, it comes under the product name is called Entrust. There are other names uh, for spinosad. And you get this at Home Depot or Lowe's, they have it. it. Just where it says active ingredient, look for spinosad, okay? It'll say spinosad. Spinosad will kill caterpillars, okay? It will kill every caterpillar you have. It is organic. It is OMRI approved, which is a group of thing uh, agency that approves things for organic use. Spinosa is very safe, but it will kill caterpillars. Uh, it'll it, also, kill, it, it kills all ahead. caterpillars, including like butterfly caterpillars, correct? So. Correct. And that's why some people are, eh, well, I would not use it on your dill or uh, your herbs. I would use it on uh, things like tomatoes. You're not going to have butterfly caterpillars on your tomatoes. Okay, they're not going to eat your Solanacea crop. Okay. Um, so I had a big problem this past year with um, I, I don't recall um, what what the name of them were currently, but it was a it was a it was a small caterpillar that turned the color of the snapdragons as they were consuming the flowers, and I had to throw away as many as I was harvesting because. The caterpillars were so bad. Um, so I'm thinking spinosis would be, but I, but um, um, shoot, somebody from Ag Extension said BT was my ticket, but I was concerned that it was going to kill the butterfly caterpillars. Okay. <clears throat> I would have recommended spinosis and not BT for your flowers. Why is that? Because BT would have worked. That would have been worked right. And you see, well, that's what this is right here. This is Bacillus thuringiensis or BT. That's what BT stands for, Bacillus thuringiensis. <clears throat> you have to spray that onto your plant and the caterpillar has to eat it, okay? It has to eat the BT. In order to eat the BT, it has to eat your plant. And so there's the damage. And so for protecting your flowers, BT is not what I recommend. I would recommend spinosad because it will kill the caterpillar on contact, all right? BT is what I recommend for caterpillars of things like cabbage and broccoli, okay? And you'll see these little holes in the broccoli and cabbage before the head ever starts to form. And that's when you spray your BT. And so they'll go ahead and eat BT. They'll also eat some of your leaf, but we don't care because that you're not gonna harvest that leaf. You're only gonna harvest the broccoli head or the cabbage head, not the outer leaves. So we let them go ahead and eat that and we spray the BT and the BT will work really well. The spinosad will work really well too. It all depends on which one. Spinosad is made from bacteria that have been fermented to give off a particular compound, and then we harvest that compound. Okay. Could you speak specifically how to apply that the spinosad pr product? Uh, spinosad almost always comes in a spray, and so you just spray it on. The BT often comes in, in a powder. I, I recommend uh, you get the kind that is a uh, uh, liquid form just because the powder will cake up and it'll get in one area and then of the leaf and not the other area of the leaf. And Kim's coming on to tell me to shut up and get going <laughs> here. A few, few more minutes, maybe just two minutes to kind of wrap up. Thank okay. you, Jerry. So this has been awesome. All right. The last thing I'd recommend then is pyrethrin. 
This is Pygannic. This is from uh, uh, chrysanthemum leaves or flowers that have been ground up and a pyrethrin comes out of them. Th these, this is a little more chemically and it's one I, uh, I, it's last on my list, okay? I like the horticulture oils, the Bavaria. If you have real problems with your flowers and you wanna save your flowers, then use spinosa. It will not only kill caterpillars, but it'll kill other beetles. I mean, beetles too. So spinosa is pretty good. Uh, just be careful that you only put it on your flowers and because it'll kill anything else it happens to get a hold of. So, but it's totally safe for humans and dogs and cats. And, and you, you said it's Omri approved. So that, that's, my, that's my green light. Yes, it's Omri approved. So is BT, so is insecticidal soaps, so is Bavaria and the horticulture oils. The pyrethrin is too, but that would be my last thing I would choose to spray. And that's all I have for tonight. If anybody has any questions, you can uh, send them or um, I, I know we have some a speaker after me. I don't want to take up any more time for her. Thank you so much, Jerry. I don't know if um, there's just a couple of questions if you're able to answer them quickly. Otherwise, quickly. you know, we can just um, have folks email them. Um, someone wanted to know a little bit more about spittlebug. Her rubecchia were infested with spittlebug, and she wants to know if she did something to attract them. No, you didn't. Uh, the spittlebugs are just in the area. Uh, they like certain uh, plants more than others. And so that particular plant, they just liked, and they're going to come after it. And the adults are just very good at finding those plants that her young are going to do well on. So you just have to be aware of that. You'll have spittle bugs next year too. Thanks, Jerry. Another question had to do with um, how you make habitat for some of the predatory insects. I know you talked a little bit about the straw um, for a few of them. Did you have any other recommendations? I would go after the straw mulch and I would go after um, flowering uh, plants. Uh, one, one thing you go after is some straw mulch with clover, some kind of clover, red clover, crimson clover, not so much white clover. I don't like white, like white clover, but the crimson or red clover are very good at attracting natural enemies and pollinators at the same time. So I, I'd go after something like that. But uh, you can also go after something a little more formal by uh, buying the mixture of uh, wild uh, seeds and uh, put, put planting those out near your field. Thank you. Um, and another question is- Clover by, I'm sorry, Kim, but clover by itself plant- Oops, she froze up. We'll come back to you, Michelle. Um, and another question was what equipment you use when you're scouting for insects in the garden? Uh, the, the biggest thing I use is a 10X hand lens, a magnifier, and that's about it. Uh, you don't need anything any fancier than that. You just need to get your eyes trained to see these little things on your plants. And the more you look for them, I guarantee you, the more you're going to find them. And the 10X hand lens will help you identify exactly what you're looking at. So I would buy a 10X hand lens and hang that around your neck. And that's all you need to go out in your field. Awesome. Well, I think that's about it for the questions. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please put them in the chat box. Jerry might be able to hang out for a few minutes and he could always check the chat box and answer them. Jerry, if you're able to drop your email in the chat box, that would be awesome, or I can do so at the end either way. But thank you so much. I'm always intrigued about, um, you have so much knowledge about all of these insects. And every time I've heard you speak, I've learned something new. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank, thank you for inviting me here today.
Absolutely. We'd love to have you come back anytime. So and um, if you have any upcoming programs, please let folks know, because I know they would like to catch you in other venues if possible. Okay. And lots of accolades in the chat box if you haven't seen them. All right. So next up is Miss Sharifa Williams, who's going to talk to you guys a little bit more about uh, the Ag Census, when it's coming up. Um, I think there's some new things for urban farms in terms of them being counted in the Ag Census. So I'll let her talk a little bit more about that. Yes, thank you. And um, I feel bad, Jerry, that I'm coming um, after you because you were, were a wealth of knowledge. Um, I've learned so much. Um, to even take care of my little small garden out in my backyard. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I just have one quick um, slide, not even a slide, it's a, um, a PDF to show you guys. Let me see if I can get it up one second. Here, you might need to stop sharing your screen. I'm not sure. Thank you. All right, multiple. All right, let's see if I have the multiple will let me. All righty, I think if this is it. And I'm gonna show all windows. Sorry guys, I'm, I have too many windows open. That's my problem. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Can you see my screen? Um, not yet. It looks like it's trying, though. It might just be a little bit of a delay. Yeah. My whole family's home, and they're banging with the internet bandwidth. <laughs> we can see it now. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to scroll down to my uh, contact information. This is just a flyer that um, I shared. Oh, I can scroll. One second. That I uh, shared with a uh, group that I spoke with before. Okay, here's, here's my contact information. I'm going to be really quick today. I really appreciate it, Kim, for uh, you inviting me um, to share this message. This is just a quick message that um, I prepared, um, trying to um, solicit you guys to help um, get the word out about the, the census of ag. First of all, I'm hoping that you guys have heard about the, the census of agriculture. Um, and I'm just going to, to, to tell you why it's important. And um, so I don't know if you guys knew that the 2022 Census of Agricultural Mail this fall, um, we do this once every five years. Uh, the data collection impacts decisions about the farm bill, disaster assistance, grants, programs, rural and, ur and urban investment and more. For the urban ag community and communities like urban ag, the Ag Census data helps tell our, our neighborhoods and the nation and the world, the ag world, our story. If you are an ag producer who did not receive a 2017 Census of Ag and you do not currently receive USDA service, uh, surveys, censuses or surveys, please sign up. The 2022 Census of Ag, um, you can go to NAS, N-A-S-S, dot USDA, dot gov, backslash Ag Census today to sign up. We just want to make sure that you guys are aware that the Census of Ag is your voice and your opportunity, and is your future. Um, that's kind of really what I wanted to share today. Um, I can go to our website, share that as well, um, where you would go to sign up. I want you guys to really understand the importance of being counted. Um, we do know in NAS that the urban ag community is underrepresented. Um, and we want to make sure that community is represented for the 2022 census and all of the other 500 surveys that we conduct throughout the year. Um, it's just data is power. And I can't express enough how much is important for all of agriculture to be counted. We need to know how the um, pandemic, this current pandemic has impacted you guys. We need to know how um, the increase in prices have impacted you guys. 
we just need to know this information. And um, the only way we know this is by you guys responding to our surveys, surveys, our censuses and surveys. I know it could be a daunting task to do so, but trust me, this data is used by policymakers to make all types of decisions. Um, I'm gonna share a little small story. I had the opportunity to, um, to be a, a staffer for a congressman. And um, he sat on the agricultural committee and they called for NAS data. When they wanna make policy decisions and they need to make decisions, they call for NAS data. Um, and you just, my, my passion and what I really want to see is that all farmers and at least my states, Maryland and Delaware, are accounted for, no matter what the size is. So that's my two cents. Um, I will show you quickly our website <clears throat> where you can go and sign up. Let me see, there we go. It might take a second for it to pop up again. Can you guys see it? Yes, and I, and I filled mine in and sent it back, Shariba. Wonderful, wonderful. And um, you guys have my information. This website is a wealth of knowledge. Um, just to, to share that, um, you guys can use this data to make decisions as well. Um, the, we have our publications. Um, every publication that we have put out is on this website. Uh, if you wanted to look for something that was more state specific, you can do that as well. Uh, you can look for census data. Um, here's by state just trying to show you as much information as possible. I always say I wanna do a, um, a presentation on how to find data and what data is available, but I, I probably will do that at a later date. But um, yeah, you, everything is state specific. There's so much knowledge and so much data out here. Um, if you guys can't find it and you're looking for data, please feel free to give me a call. I am always available. Um, but I, I just can't stress enough. Tell all of your friends, all of your colleagues to sign up to be counted. Um, it's very, very important. And um, that's kind of all I have for today. Um, here's the, the area where you can go to sign up to be counted. You click on census and you can go right here and click here and you can just sign up to be counted. I'm waiting for it to come up. <laughs> So yes, and it's very easy, just sign up to be counted and um, you'll get your census and you will be counted. And that's kind of all I have, Kim. Um, are there any questions? Do you guys have any questions in regards to what data is available? Um, anything of that magnitude? What in particular is, is being um, accounted for like urban agriculture or not accounted for urban agriculture currently that you're hoping to move forward with? It's just the whole, the whole urban ag community is just um, underrepresented. And the only reason, the only thing we can conclude is that you, the urban ag community, there's, they don't consider themselves as farmers. Um, they don't understand that, you know, based off of our definition that we do still consider them as farmers, um, the, the urban ag community. And they just, you know, we just, you guys fly under the radar. You don't even, you might not know about NAS or, you know, you just don't sign up to be counted. So we want to make sure that, you know, this message is out there. We're doing everything we can to get it out. We're um, targeting social media. Um, we're just doing everything to make sure that all farmers, big, small, medium, are aware of NAS and the importance of being counted. Well, should we? Yeah, this is Anthony. I, I received the uh, the census and I actually um, read it and I responded to them because of the, of the uh, financial requirement, which I don't meet. So someone was supposed to call me back and they haven't done it yet. So I'll follow up again, but that was the concern that I had. If you don't meet the financial uh, requirement, I'm just filling it out still leaves me just where I am. Whether you get that information or not, you'll know uh, by the Prince George's records that we established ourselves as an urban farm. Right. So the 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 definition that we use that, that 
um, we use as a farm is any operation that has $1,000 or of sales or would normally have $1,000 worth of sales within that year. So if you have $1,000 worth of sales or, or you've sold $1,000 worth of your product, then we deem you as a farm. And you're talking about the 2017 census because we do this every five years. So no, I received this one this year. So you got the, the decennial census. No, I got well, I got something from USDA from AG. Okay, well, you might have got maybe I, I I can't tell you what you got because there's so many surveys that the USDA oh. does, but our census is not we don't mail out until November or December of this year for the census. Hmm. Well, I have one. And I did call in because they said if you had questions, call in. And I did. I was waiting for a call back. Uh, I'll follow up. I understand what you're saying, but I have the same issue with PG County, which they require $2,500 well, $2, of uh, produce or income from farming before well, you can deal with their taxes, uh, deal with the tax opportunity and so forth. But I'll follow up because we're, we're listed and we'll see what happens. James, you can always call me. I'm your person. I am I'm over Maryland and Delaware. And if, right. it, if it came from us, I, I can definitely uh, call me. I'll work it out. We'll All figure right. it out. But like I said, the census is not mailing until December of this year. And we haven't mailed anything out in regards to the census. But we do other surveys throughout the year. All right. Another way to look at it is you have to be accounted for. I mean, say maybe 5% of the respondents are under that $1,000 threshold. They'll, they'll never know to change that threshold or to make adjustments to the programs they offer if, if your feedback isn't recorded and if they don't get an understanding of who's out there and, and what, um, you know, what's going on. And then, and then one final point is not everybody gets a survey. You're essentially also, you're representing X amount of operations of your size. So right. if, if you don't send your data in, then that's just so many more people that aren't being accounted for um, of your size operation. I understand. There is, a, there is one, one correction for the census. The census, um, it's, we're supposed to account for everybody. If, if you have not gotten the census, we just don't know you're out there. And that means that we're at, that's why we're asking and pushing that you sign up to be counted. There is a lot of people that do slip um, between the cracks. Now, the other surveys that we do throughout the year, he's absolutely correct. We, we will take a sample, it's randomized. If you're selected, then you're in. If you're not, then you're not. And a large majority of our list is not sampled um, or is not picked through the, the random sampling. Uh, but um, for the census, yeah, in fact, it's supposed to be everybody that we know of that's on our list frame, we send a questionnaire. If you have not received a questionnaire, a census questionnaire, and the last time we did one was in 2017, then we just don't know you're there. So you have to sign up to be counted. Any other questions for Sharifa? <laughs> We really appreciate you coming on tonight, Sharifa, because you're absolutely right. It's so important for folks to be counted and to provide their feedback and input. So um, if you know you guys know other urban farmers, please share this. Um, the link was put in the chat. I'll try to share the link again when I send out the recording. Um, and Jerry and Sharifa, if you guys have like a PDF or a document that you, any documents or resources that you would like me to share as a follow-up, I'm happy to include those as well when I send it out to our listserv tomorrow or maybe might be the day after. Wonderful. I'll send you something um, either tomorrow, tonight or tomorrow. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, I'll send you a PDF. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate it. Anyone else have any questions for Sharifa or Jerry? All right, well, I'm gonna leave this open for a few more minutes in case folks do have questions, but I just wanna formally end the program and the recording. And again, thank you so much to Gary and Sharif for, for sharing your time and all of your knowledge and information with us. We really appreciate you. I hope you'll come back. 
Absolutely.